Hello there, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How about you? I'm good, thank you. Okay. So tell me about yourself. Um, I'm my name, my name is Sarah. Sarah. Okay, Sarah. First of all, can you turn your cameras on, Sarah? Yeah. Perfect. Tell me something about yourself. Um, I'm 15. Mm -hmm. I'm in Yeti. And I'm doing um, high combined science. Okay, perfect. So, Sarah, today I've chosen the topic of pathogens. So, first of all, tell me what your current score in science is. It's like 50% to 60. Okay. And is there any reason why you're at 50 or 60? It's mostly because like, I panic in exams a lot. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And so year end exams are coming. How are you dealing with the stress? I'm trying to come over it and like practice more questions so when I get to the exam it will be easier for me to answer. Perfect, that is nice. And tell me about what topics do you think are the most difficult for you to deal with? In biology? Yeah. Um, mitosis and meiosis are kind of similar, which kind of confuses me sometimes. Fair enough. So... If topics are similar to each other, it gets confusing. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Hello there, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Okay, can you tell me about yourself? Uh, my name is Driss, I'm in year 10. I'm thank 15. You. Okay, Driss. Um, can you turn your cameras on, Driss, by any possibility? My camera doesn't work. doesn't work. Okay, no problem. Okay, so I have chosen a topic of pathogens. There's a very logical reason to choose pathogens here. The reason is that this topic, at this point of time, it's like current affairs to us. That's exactly what happened in the pandemic. So we need to gain that information about how is it that the pathogens are there, what all kinds of pathogens there may be, so this topic kind of connects to what happened in the pandemic. So there's a high chance that these kind of questions will come in the exam more. There's So because of which it becomes important for us to focus on all the points in this topic. So first of all, do you guys have any idea what pathogens are? No. Okay. Um, they're har harmful microorganisms that cause disease. Good. Very well. That is correct. That pathogens are microorganisms that causes disease. Now, first of all, before starting with the details of what pathogens and all stuff, I want you to write down the def definitions of the word communicable and non-communicable and that in terms of diseases. So basically think about what are communicable diseases and what are non-communicable diseases? Tell me once you guys are done writing. Don't hide. Okay, perfect. Sarah? Yeah, I'm done. Okay, so let's start with Sarah. I want you to tell me what is communicable diseases. Um, I think it's like a disease that gets transferred easily. And then a non-communicable non um, disease is ones that aren't transferred. Between each other. Yeah. Perfect. Hello there, how are you? Can you hear me? Okay. 
till they're connecting. Driss, I want you to tell me what have you written down. I said, um, a communicable disease is a disease spread between two people or between a person and an animal. Okay, and non-communicable? <clears throat> um, diseases are uh, not spread between two things. Okay, fair enough. Hello there, how are you? The one that joined uh, just now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, what's your name? My name is Staffy. Staffy, is that correct? Yes. Okay, Staffy. We're talking about communicate. Uh, we're talking about pathogens, basically. So we just started now. Um, we just discussed what is communicable and non-communicable diseases. Do you know anything about that? I'm um, not. Not really. Okay, fair enough. So Sarah and Driss have just answered what they think is communicable and non-communicable diseases. You guys are correct, what you guys said. But here, in both of you guys' statements, I, I would like to add one word, which I want you guys to follow. And the word is transmitted. Now, instead of using spread, use transmitted. The reason I'm specifying the word is in the exam, you're judged and you're marked on the basis of the kind of words you use. The more scientific the word, the better the impression. So, you uh, you know, so for example, if I am correcting somebody's paper, if I am, you know, impressed enough with their vocabulary, scientific vocabulary, so I would know that this kid can do it. So try to think of that in uh, in a sense that it gives you a better advantage that whenever you write in a scientific vocabulary, if for the person who's going to mark your sheet, it gives out a good impression. So first that. And second, second is that sometimes what happens is there's specific words that get you marks. For example, if the marking scheme said that you would be given the marks on the basis of if you've written the word transmitted or not, Spread would not mean anything. So use the word transmitted. So communicable, as the word suggests, it can communicate. So it can transmit from one person to another. Now, this can also be in animals as well, like Driss added. That's perfectly correct. While non-communicable cannot be transmitted from one person to another. So communicable diseases are quite literally communicable, can be transmitted from one person to the other. Non-communicable ones cannot be transmitted from one person to the other. Now, one by one, I want you guys to think of examples of each one of them. So, Staffy, let's start with you. Tell me uh, one example of communicable disease. Staffy, can you hear me? Okay, Sarah, let's start with you then. One example of communicable um, disease? Measles. Good one. Yeah. Tris, one for non-communicable uh, diseases. What disease? Non-communicable. Coronary heart disease. Yes. Which health disease? Specify. I've got another one. Uh, cancer. Good one. Um, Steffi, tell me one communicable disease. Um, COVID. Good one. Perfect. So, yes. Now, um, Sarah, I want you to think of one non-communicable disease. Um, chronic lung illnesses. Come again? Chronic lung illnesses. Okay, lung illnesses, perfect. Yeah. Um, Dress, I want you to think of one communicable disease. Uh, mumps. Good. 
Steffi, I want you to think of one non-communicable disease. Heart disease. Heart disease. Now, whenever you guys are saying heart diseases, specify that it's cardiovascular ones. Okay, so that is correct. So there's measles, mumps, rubella, malaria, COVID, cancer, heart attack, diabetes, asthma. So these are some examples of both communicable and non-communicable diseases. So, like I asked, what is a pathogen? To which Tris answered that it's a microorganism that causes illness. It is correct. So pathogens are microorganisms that cause diseases. There's only four types of pathogens that you guys need to study about. Let's do a backstory first so that you can remember the names of them and then we'll move forward to the features of each one of them. So first thing first, that whenever we're talking about organisms, it is important for us to actually mention that all the organisms are classified under five kingdom classification, which starts from the first kingdom, which has all the bacteria, then followed by the second kingdom, which is protist. For those who don't know what is a protist, I'll explain in a bit. Then there's fungi. Then there's plants and animals. Okay, the reason that I've drawn this in a shape is because it is easier to remember their features like this. The first organism ever to be discovered on the planet, the oldest organism, is a bacteria. After which, we have evidences that protist came in. And then after protist, it was fungi that was found. After which, we found plants and animals round about the same time. So they are on the same level. Now let's come on to the features of each one of them. Can somebody tell me what are the features of bacteria? Um, they have like a flagella. That is correct. Um, chromosomal DNA and plasmids. Mm -hmm. so they, don't have they don't have a nucleus. Okay, that is also correct. What do you call the cell? 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 Um, Go on, sorry. They have they a cell, cell membrane. They do. Perfect. Now, what is a cell called when it does not have a nucleus? Um, um, eukaryotic. The opposite. Oh, no. Prokaryotic. Yeah. So, prokaryotic. Now let's break down the words so that you guys never forget the meaning and never mix them up. Pro, care, yotic. Pro means primitive, which means old. Care in biology always means nucleus, which means this word is talking about an old nucleus, not a absence of nucleus. The reason being, um, Steffi, can you tell me what all is present? Oh, Steffi is gone. Driss, can you tell me what is all present in the nucleus? Uh, it's like genetic material, chromosomes. Yeah, and genes. they're all perfect, good. And the DNA, the chromosomes, the genes are all bound with a nuclear membrane. That's what we call nucleus, right? Yes? Do you guys agree that if I have the DNA and if I enclose yeah. it in a membrane, that's what I call a nucleus? Yeah. 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 Prokaryotics have the DNA. They don't, they don't just have the membrane to it. So prokaryotic means the organisms that lack nuclear membrane. So you can say they don't have a well-advanced or well-developed nucleus. 
Now, another thing that's very, very prominent for bacteria is uh, they're all unicellular. Steffi, everything all right there? Yeah. yeah. Now, coming to the opposite word of prokaryotic, which is eukaryotic. So, I'm just writing you and care. You means advanced. A good way to remember this is you sounds like new. You new. So it has new nucleus. Which means not only does it have the genetic material, but its genetic material is present in a membrane. Make sense to all of you? Yeah. 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 Steffi, do you understand? Yes. yes. Perfect. Prokaryotes are when they're eukaryotic, but they're also unicellular. That's what prokaryote organisms are. For example, this one. It looks like a slipper. That's how I learned it. So you can learn it like this as well. This looks like a slipper. It's known as paramecium. And so there's different shapes. For example, one most famous one that you must have heard is amoeba. You guys have heard about amoeba? Yeah. Yeah. That's a prokaryote. Make sense? How would yeah. you identify that um, protist is... Oh, sorry. Yeah. So amoeba is a protist. How would you identify? You see that it has no nucleus. Yeah, so it has a cell, which is a single cell, and it has a nucleus. Unicellular, having nucleus organisms are protist. So that's how you can remember. Coming to the next one, the fungi. Now they're different, they've bit developed, so they're still eukaryotic. But these organisms are unicellular, multicellular, but they, likes to live, they like to live in colonies. What I mean when I say colonies are, they are made up of thread-like structures. Who are, have you guys ever seen a mold, a bread mold? No. Yeah. Okay. Stuffy, have you seen it? No. no. Sarah, Stuffy, I want you to Google it. Google bread mold and tell me how it looks like. Andres, I know you've seen it, so tell me, how does that look like? The red part of it's gone green. It is. What else? What's one prominent thing that looks, you know, that's very, very clear when you look at a mold? Like fuzzy. Mm -hmm. It looks like a well-woven, dense spider web, right? That's what it looks like. Lots of stuff, stuff, stuff. And if you look at that carefully, the threads. So each one of those threads are known as hyphae. All fungis have hyphae. All fungis, um, I would say, basic, fundamental of, you know, structure of fungal body is hyphae. They will have threads. Clear to everyone? Yeah. Yes. But there's a fungi called mushroom. Have you ever seen threads in that? Be curious. We all know mushrooms yeah. are fungi. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Mushrooms grow their hyphae in that way. So they grow hyphae like this and then the top. So that's how their threads grow. So even mushrooms are, <clears throat> mushrooms are th uh, threads. If you shred them, they will shred into hyphae, not like 
chunks. There would never be chunks. There would always be threads. But their thread is very well structured, so it looks like a mushroom. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Now, plants and animals, you all know, I think. Plants are eukaryotic, photosynthetic organisms. Animals are eukaryotic, heterotrophic organisms. So we can leave that apart because the bottom three are all pathogens. These two are not pathogens, although they can equally harm the organisms, but they're not. Now coming to the last pathogen that's written on the screen but has not been explained yet. Viruses. Viruses are something that's known as acellular. What we've studied in these five kingdoms, they're all living. They all have a basic cellular structure. Even a bacteria has a DNA, cell membrane, cell wall, flagella, or cytoplasm. All of the things that it needs are present in the bacteria. Viruses don't. Basically, viruses are made up of two things. Protein, that's the outside, and the genetic material which, by the way, may be RNA or DNA. That's why we do not uh, count viruses as living organisms, because yes, they're capable of infection, but they can only work, they can only replicate when they're inside the host body. Outside the host body, they can't really work. They're as good as dead. I don't know if you guys remember that, but if you do, please tell me. When the lockdown started, the first lockdown ever that happened in March 2021, um, when it was starting, uh, the government actually announced that the lockdown would only be for 14 to 15 days, right? Yeah. Yes. Dris, did you heard? About, uh, did you hear about that? Yeah. The reason the government said that was because. That's the lifespan. 14 days is the lifespan. COVID, coronavirus could stay outside. That's it. If we as responsible citizens could have stayed in the houses for those 14 days properly, the pandemic would not have happened. Like all over the world, it would not have happened because that was one, one news that was spread throughout the world. That only 14 days and it's going to be all right. Because if we would have stayed inside back then, coronavirus would have been outside in the atmosphere, finding zero host to spread into. So after 14 days, because of not finding a host cell, it would have died. Which means viruses can only stay outside a host for a certain period of time, after which they need a host. The reason being, they can only replicate, they can only um, flourish when they're inside the host cell. Outside the host cell, they're just living things lying around. If somebody comes and picks them up, like somebody catches them, that's when they can infect. But viruses can't walk. Viruses can't do anything. They're just practically non-living things outside the host cell. Clear, everyone? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now... There's going to be a fun activity that would be done one by one. Now, this checks your memory. So, I'm going to set a timer for 10 seconds. One by one, I'm going to call out somebody's name. There's features. So, viruses, then fungi, then protist, and then uh, vir uh, uh, bacteria. One by one, I would give you 10 seconds. You can read the slide as much as you can. With uh, After 10 seconds, I'm going to come back to this slide. And whoever's name I took, they're supposed to tell me the features. Ready? Did you guys understand what you're supposed to do? Yes. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Okay, I would want to start with Sarah. Okay. Tell me when you're ready for your 10 seconds. I'm ready. Perfect. There you go.
and the time is up. So tell me what you learned about bacteria. Sorry. I forgot to unmute myself. myself. Sorry. Okay. Um, so basically, they have a flagellum. Mm -hmm. They are prokaryotic and then unicellular. And then they have a lot of mitochondrion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The mitochondrion one is the wrong one. They don't have mitochondria at all. Oh. So let's learn the features of bacteria. If you guys want to draw it, you guys can draw it as well simultaneously. So first of all, they're prokaryotes. I told you what is prokaryotes, which is that they don't have a true nucleus. They only have a circular strand of DNA. They do not contain mitochondria. Now there's a trick to remember which organisms have mitochondria, which ones don't. The ones that have a nucleus can have a mitochondria. The ones that don't have a proper nucleus cannot have mitochondria, which means imagine mitochondria and nuclear membrane as one unit. If one is present, the other one would be present. If uh, the first one is not present, the other one cannot be there. Make sense? Yes. Perfect. Yeah. The next thing is that they have a tail, which is known as flagellum, which helps them move. Now, this is May. Reason being, not all bacteria need it. For example, the bacteria that are present on my uh, uh, flask, they don't need to swim. The ones that may be inside the water may want to swim, but the ones that are on the surface of this flask do not need. So the sipper itself has bacteria, but those bacteria have no tail. The bacteria that are inside the water, they will have. Um, tail because they need to swim not all of them needs to swim next is this they release toxins that damage the cells and tissues i want you guys to write down this point in bold or like star it up what happens is bacteria are small i agree they're very very small for a fact but what happens is red blood cells in your body let's say they're present like this now, bacteria are smaller than them. Let's say that's your bacteria. Bacteria number two. Bacteria number three. Now, bacteria are capable of releasing toxins. When they do so, and the toxin comes in contact with the cells, it irritates the cells. It damages the cell. Never kill them, but yes, irritate the cell. Because of which, you may see random rashes, redness, itchiness, or inflammation. So like random places. When that happens, that's probably a bacteria releasing toxins. Our body has a way to solve it out. But this is something that's really important for our defense system. You need to remember this. Okay? Yeah. First, Steffi. Yeah. Perfect. They're all living cells because they have a nucleus, the cytoplasm, the um, chromosome. They have a cell wall, cell membrane, flagellum. And they're 10 micrometers long. How much is a micrometer? Is it times 10 to the minus 6? Yes. So... For those who don't remember, in biology, you only have three units, milli, micro, nano. When you go this way, you always times it by 1,000. When you go backwards, you divide it by 1,000. And... One above this is meter.
So that means 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 9 is nanometer. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 is micrometer. 1, 2, 3, 3 is millimeter. Make sense? Yeah. Yes. yes. Now, examples of bacteria may be salmonella. You need to remember this because it causes infection in humans. Moving on to, uh, Steffi, this is your turn. I'm going to give you 10 seconds. You have to read about viruses and tell me, okay? Tell me when you're ready, Steffi. And I'm ready. Okay, there you go. And the time is up. Steffi, what did you learn? Um, um, viruses can cause an infection by damaging cells and tissues. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Um. Uh No. no problem. It's okay. So let's learn about viruses. First thing first, like I said, they are not cells. Again, write this down in your notebooks carefully. They're smaller than uh, bacteria. They reproduce rapidly inside host cell. Write this point down as well. Inside host cell. And that's exactly why there's no uh, medicines that can kill viruses. Because viruses are present inside a cell, which means if I need to kill the virus, I need to kill my cell as well. So that is why there's no um, viral medicines. Although there's a medicine that's known as antiviral, but antivirals only slow down the viruses. They can't destroy it. How viruses deal with cells is, let's say this is a cell of my body. The virus sends its DNA inside the cell. Now, this has to be understood that a human cell or organism cell can make DNA and proteins both. DNA by DNA replication, proteins because the cells have ribosome, right? Yeah. Now, viruses only have that two things, proteins and DNA. Once this DNA gets in, it gets replicated with the cell's DNA and the cell starts making both the proteins and the DNA of the viruses, which means the body technically becomes a factory for viruses. And once it is stuffed enough to not get to have no space for viruses whatsoever, the cell will burst open and the viruses will be freed. Which means viruses kind of hijack the cells in a way that they kind of force the cell to do whatever they want to. Once they're done with the cell, they burst it open, go to the next cell. Because of which, it's difficult to kill the viruses, but it's also important to kill them. So that's why we use antiviral drugs to slow them down so that our body can... It's almost like um, the antiviral drug will hold it back while the... Uh, human body defense system can come and kill it. But there's no medicine that can kill viruses, not even the vaccine. Vaccine was not killing the virus. It was just protecting you against it. Make sense? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Now, Dres, it's your turn. Tell me when you're ready. I'm ready. Perfect. There you go. And the time is up. Tell me, what did you learn? Um, prokaryotes are uh, eukary eukaryotic cells. Mm -hmm. 
um, they can be, wait, uh, they can be, um, is it that they can be, uh, parasites and, uh, animal cells and plant cells? Mm. That's it. No problem. You need to, uh, bo all of you, you guys need to increase your speed of reading or actually observing, just observing. Um, this is something that would happen in universities quite very often. You would be told to look at a slide for 20 seconds and move on. In those 20 seconds, whatever you can look at, you would have to make notes of that. So it's like a practice that you guys should have. Now, protist can also be known as protozoa and they're all eukaryotes. They are single cell organisms. They can be parasitic and they can live inside the host or on the host. On the host, like how lice does. All the lice is not a protozoa, but lots of protozoa can live on, uh, uh, you know, the head. And they are animal-like, plant-like and fungi-like. You don't need to go into the details of it, but this cell has a contractile vacuole which if you study animal cell in detail, you would know it's a plot of animal cell. It has a food vacuole. That's a feature that's only present in um, uh, plant cells. And then it also has uh, structural features that are very, very similar to fungi, which are not mentioned here. So you don't need to go in details, but remember that it has features of all organisms. Malaria is the disease that's caused by a protozoa. Now the last one. Okay, first of all, let's learn the life cycle of malarian parasite. It's not too much. Just remember this much. Okay. Let's start with when the mosquito bites you. When a mosquito bites you, it sends eggs of the par uh, parasite or the protozoa inside your body and it goes into your liver cells. Now I've told you a cycle, which is it goes in Divides, 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 divide, divide, and then burst open the cell, go to the next one. These eggs of the protozoa does the exact same thing. They get into the liver cells, keep on dividing them. And if the cell gets too much, if, if it gets too much for the cell, they burst open, get out. Then eventually, slowly and slowly, they get into red blood cells and do the exact same thing. Also, in the red blood cells, they also start making their own gametes. So this is a sexual cycle. There's just dividing, dividing, dividing and making gametes. Then a mosquito would have to bite you again. In that mosquito's body, it would go and fertilize the gametes, make a baby, which then can be again thrown into a human body by the bite of the mosquito. Which means the mosquito here is as much as a victim that humans are. But humans call mosquitoes as a vector because they're capable of transferring disease from one organism to another. So it's called a vector, but it is not the mosquito that causes it. It's the protozoa that causes it. And the half the life cycle of the protozoa happens in the mosquito's body. Make sense? Yeah. 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 Now, from this part, there's not a lot of questions that come. They usually just ask you about the mosquito. So remember that. And also that in human body, two parts that are effect affected are liver cells and red blood cells. That's it. Moving on to fungi. I've told you quite some about fungi. So toadstool, mushrooms, molds are all examples of fungi. The cell wall is made up of chitin. How many of you guys have seen the shiny layer that's present on the cockroaches yeah 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 that's chitin now the feature for chitin is it can fold but it can't break it can fold as much as you want to that's why if even if you step on a mis or cockroach it would squash but that part that shiny thing would stay intact it would just kind of fold so like crack, you can say, 
chitin is a substance that cannot be broken that easily. It's a very strong thing to have as a cell wall. Fungi has it. They're saprophytic in nature, which means they feed on dead and decay by decaying them. They release enzymes so that they can digest the dead and decay and then they absorb it. Their structures have hyphae and hyphae can produce spores. For example, these are the threads. One of these threads would just get up, make a spore like this, and <clears throat> make more spores inside it. It would then open up, and wherever that spore falls, there would be the next hyphae falling down. And there would be more and more hyphae formed. That is why fungus can spread easily. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Anyone has any questions? No. Okay, I'm a prokaryote. I do not contain mitochondria. I produce toxins. What is this? Bacteria. Bacteria. Perfect. I'm a eukaryote. I may be parasitic and I can cause malaria. Protests. Perfect. My cell wall is made up of chitin and I have a thread like structure called hyphae. Fungi. Fungi. Okay. Perfect. I reproduce rapidly inside a host cell until they burst open. Bacteria. Viruses. Okay. Virus. Yes, it is viruses. Now, uh, Sarah told me she has a problem in uh, remembering prokary uh, sorry, mitosis and meiosis. So I'm going through that. I want uh, Deris and uh, Driss and uh, Steffi to also tell me what points we can discuss, although we have limited time today. So we shall discuss your doubts in the next class as well. So let me find a page. Okay, let me draw it here. Mitosis and meiosis. Now, the easiest thing, easiest way to remember mitosis and meiosis is that meiosis is equals to two times mitosis. Now I'm telling you the phases of the cycle. I can get a blank page. Hold on. Yeah. So the Let's study about mitosis first. Mitosis happens in interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, cytokinesis. In interphase, nothing happens. In the interphase, they just grow the cell and the cell divide, uh, replicates its own nucleus. How that happens is chromosome pair number one. looks like this then. So what it did is, this was chromosome pair number one. They made copies of each other, stick with themselves. So the number of chromosome is still 46 on both sides, but this one has 92 worth of DNA. Make sense? Yeah. 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 This is interface. All that happens is, DNA replication and growth. Then starts prophase. In prophase, the DNA would start to form chromosomes. I'm just drawing one so that it's more clear. Then in the metaphase, both of them like this align on the metaplate through spindle fibers sent by centriole. So this is centriole. This is spindle fiber. Once this is done, starts the anaphase. In anaphase, nothing but they're pulled apart. So what happens is this is a chromosome that looks like an X. They're pulled to two different directions. So that's what is going to happen. So one comes here like this and the other ones go there. So what happened is 
this is pulled in one direction, the other one is pulled in the other direction. That's anaphase. Once this is done, in telophase, what happens is the cell starts to grow their nucleus is back. So the nuclear membrane will reappear. Then starts the furrow formation like this. This is known as cytokinesis, which leads to formation of two cells. Now, here there were 46 but 92 chromosome worth of DNA. Here it was same. Now here, the 92 worth DNA was separated, which means here it is 46 and here also it is 46. So this cell has 46 chromosomes, this has 46, same with these two. And they have chromosomes that look like this. Make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what happens in meiosis is exactly the same thing, except after this stage, the cell goes back in prophase. Which means it has 46 cells, uh, 46 chromosomes right now, and without replication, without making this structure, it goes back into division. By the end of which, it would have four cells, each of which would only have 23 chromosomes each, because whatever chromosomes it has would be divided in the anaphase. So 23 would go to one side, other 23 would go to the other. Make sense? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So if I have to draw a cell cycle for meiosis, in meiosis, what happens is interphase, prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, telophase one, cytokinesis one, then prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, telophase two, and then cytokinesis two. That's meiosis. Clear? No. Yeah. There's also one another difference, which I would tell you once you've understood this much which is like, which would complicate the things a bit, which is that the chromosomes get divided in the first meiosis as it itself. Whatever division has to take place happens in first division itself. So maybe in the next class, I can add on to that confusion. But for now, what I want you guys to do is, after the class, read about uh, pathogens, read about mitosis, and read about meiosis. Some part of meiosis, especially the parts that talk about radiation, may be a little difficult for you to understand. Like I said, I did not tell you about the complication, but it's just one point difference. You would understand that easily. So read about these points and tell me if you have any doubts, okay? Okay. Okay. Anybody else? And Steffi and Driss, would you want to tell me the points or topics that you find difficult? I don't really have anything at the top of my head right now. Okay, no problem. I need to think about it. Okay, no problem. You can think about it. Steffi, what are the points that you find? What are the topics that you find difficult? Um, what I find difficult is um microscopies. Fair enough. The numerical part. Okay. So what we can do is, in the next classes, if you guys do decide to join, of course, that. Um, if you guys do decide to join, what we can do is, first class, we can just write down the doubts for each other. And once we're done, we will start talking about the doubts one by one. Okay? Okay. Perfect. Any questions from anybody's side? No. I found something. Yeah, Tristan. Um, it's the orders, orders of magnitude. Okay, fair enough. It is confusing a bit. Reason being, we don't connect it to real life very well. So yes, we can talk about order of magnitude. That would be perfect. An idea for you, uh, Tris, is it's almost like if you and I are comparing our heights, you say you're half my size. Except the difference is, in order of magnitude, there's no half. 
everything is in times 10. So 10, 100, 1000, 10,000, it goes like that. Easiest way to find the order of magnitude is blindly put the bigger one on top, smaller one and the uh, denominator and divide. And round it off to uh, closest 10 or the multiples of 10 unit. So uh, round it off, for example, it says 14, round it off to 10. Say it says 80, round it off to 100. So just round them off to values of 100. We can do questions in the next class. So it would be easier, but that's the easiest way to do it. Blindly, bigger on top, smaller on bottom, divide them. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. In the next class, we shall talk about each of your doubts more. Okay? Okay. okay. Thank you so much for having me. Have a good evening.